Hello, everybody, and welcome to Talking Twomps. Today, we're going to be talking global health, but before we do, let's do a reintroduction to some of our favorite players, starting on my left. Oh, favorite players. I feel so loved. Uh, hi, I'm William Moore, resident Nova bitch. I'm going to have to censor myself already. Going to France. And I've actually done some global health stuff, so I feel like I'm somewhat a little bit more able at this topic. Uh, you know, he says favorite players, but we're the only one that bothered to show up. Uh, my name is Jacob Cordes, and I am actually starting to get accustomed to Nova. It's very nice outside right now. Uh, it is. Yeah, it's already. really great weather. <laughs> He's been here for we like do, less than a day. We do like... tend to suck people in. Uh, and <laughs> my name is Blake Phillips, and I'll be your host today. So as I mentioned earlier, today we're going to be talking about global health. Uh, most of the time, our our topics verge on war and, and political instability, but now China, we're talking about... Putin. Yeah, exactly. So this time we're talking about plague, you know, yes. lighthearted stuff. <laughs> But but this is actually a realm where, where most of the world, because it's the, this sector tends to be run by scientists and rather unmonitored by the political players who like to abuse science-based areas of the government, um, it seems to be tracking pretty positively. Um, but maybe it's my two t- uh, the two people sitting next to me can prove me otherwise. Um, let's, let's start broad on this topic. Global health... Um, what are we experimenting with nowadays? Um, I know one of the interest areas is uh, is women's reproductive health and, and getting that into more conservative countries. Um, what's working? What kind of programs seem to be most effective nowadays? Well, it, my particular area relating to the health that I've worked in is actually cardiac health, but it did relate to women's health um, because we were specifically targeting uh, rheumatic heart disease. Now, for those of you who aren't terribly familiar, I'll give a brief summary on what it is basically when you get a strep throat you get a type of um infection from bacteria this infection while it nominally affects your throat it also affects other parts of your body as it spreads throughout the body one of the bad parts is your cardiac valves uh which is not good because you know the cardiac valves prevent blood from mixing when it really shouldn't um if you get the infection multiple times it can actually weaken your valves to the point where they're no longer effective. They can no longer prevent blood um from flow they can no longer prevent blood from flowing between them. Which I assume is is bad. Yes, this yeah. is very bad. Okay. Um for most people who actually have this problem though, like you'll see you'll see noticeable things where if you overexert you might suffer a heart attack. Um this is particularly bad for pregnant mothers, because by virtue of them having, you know, a fetus inside their womb, they their heart has an increased load on it. This is particularly bad during birth. So many of these mothers who have this um, problem end up dying during birth because they suffer a complete heart failure. Which, uh, so, sorry, William, I don't mean to cut you off. I just do want to put out a disclaimer. None of us are women at this table, Um but I'm yes, we are testing now to the the strenuousness of childbirth. Yes, continue, William. <laughs> the, the childbirth both painful and very strenuous on your heart. So if you have this total failure, it's it's bad because the mother usually ends up dying, and the kid, their chances aren't great. Um, there's a potential that they could survive, but it's very low. Um, so this is a major issue in most of the developing world, in Africa especially. Um, Just simply because nobody treats strep throat because it's not really a priority. The focus in Africa has been nominally on AIDS, the AIDS epidemic, which is equally important. But now it is no longer actually the leading killer. Uh, Rheumatic heart disease has actually surpassed it. So working to eliminate that is actually very simple. They just need penicillin, actually, when they have strep throat to knock it out. Like, this would solve the problem. So a lot of the issues in the developing world relating to healthcare are actually economic ones, from my perspective, including women's health. Uh, because Yeah, economic and transport is also a really big problem um, that they've had to deal with. Um, you look at places like we talked about um, before we started recording the Ebola outbreak in, in uh, the Congo, and one of the reasons that the containment was so effective was because there was very rapid deployment of uh, vaccines and hazmat teams to the area. Um, and if you remember uh, the outbreak back in 2012, 2014, um, it spread much further, killed a lot more people. And one of the reasons was that the transport infrastructure in the region wasn't prepared to to um, to distribute that many vaccines, and and that doesn't just apply to uh, kind of epidemic uh, periodic diseases. It also apply, applies to these endemic diseases um, that affect 
basically the entire population, um, where transport infrastructure, not to add a boring topic onto an already boring topic, but transport infrastructure is <laughs> incredibly important. You. Health infrastructure is incredibly important and exciting. Thank you. <laughs> well, I mean, it, but it, it, it is really true that the, the major limiting factor to eliminating many of these problems are that we can't get stuff there. It, it's a huge amount of equipment and material often needed to diagnose problems and then treat them um, that many of these countries independently can't afford they if they can't even afford a road if they can't afford their road network if they can't afford to build it they're going to have trouble affording these medicines and then if they do have a donor from abroad actually donate them to them they can't get them there so having this problem is crit if we can solve the problem of transportation we can solve like 90 percent of the medical crises especially uh, erupting infectious diseases which is actually interesting if you this is where it comes up um where international comes up, uh, international focus comes up a lot. Recently, I think it was in 2015, I think a huge number of the world's biggest pharma corporations actually got together to donate the equivalent of about $14 billion in medicine. It's not finished yet. They haven't donated all that. But that's the estimated amount to actually wipe out 14 infectious diseases throughout the entire developing world, like total rad eradication mm -hmm. globally. So this is going to be a massive um, effort that's underway. And that might be the biggest um, medical breakthrough of our time. Not breakthrough, like it's going to... Achievement, be, perhaps. Ach achievement, yes. Of our time to wipe out on the level that we basically did polio, infectious diseases. And the biggest killers worldwide, collectively. We, it would save many lives, which would be quite the achievement. So we've talked a little bit about the role that transportation plays. So... You know, the, the medicine reaches the harbor or the airport, and we've got to get it to the town. Um, I'd like to touch a little bit, okay, so it's gotten there, um, and now administering it. Uh, you know, what problems do we face globally in terms of um, doctors or nurses being present in the area? Um, how are we dealing with uh, the administration of the medicine, uh, making sure that people are taking it often enough, making sure they're educated on what it does, why they should take two pills instead of four on a daily basis. Um, how, how is the, the medical community coping with that in, in just about any setting? So I don't know. I don't know about the most recent advances in coping with it, but I can bring up one problem that they often see, which is that medical missions to underdeveloped areas were modeled initially on the distribution of vaccines. Um, vaccines which generally you require one dose it's immunity for life, and there's no uh, follow-up required. And generally, um, generally, the model that was developed was that th uh, groups like Doctors Without Borders um, would get volunteer uh, medical practitioners from the West to deploy to these regions, distribute a, bun a bunch of vaccines, and essentially go home. You know, and so there was no permanent uh, improvement to the health infrastructure, but it did have uh, very, you know, beneficial effects on the area. And the problem that I think they've seen in some regions is that um, with the kind of propagation of things like HIV um, and other uh, chronic diseases, chronic infectious diseases, uh, that model is no longer effective, uh, is no longer cost effective because you can't have these doctors there 360 days a year. So there's now an increased focus on developing um, medical professionals in the country where these diseases are endemic. And so that has to do not with the diseases changing, but what diseases we're addressing changing. Right. Okay. Um, and, and to a certain extent, what disease i mean the hiv aids epidemic in africa um it it emerged it's it it has not been an endemic disease for all of history it emerged within living memory um just within living memory but still within living memory um and it's something that um has kind of it's been really challenging there is no uh, vaccine for hiv aids it is something that has to be treated um on a chronic basis. So the health infrastructure is much more difficult to construct. And so, William, you spent some time, if I remember correctly, in Uganda. Yes, um, in Uganda. And tapped into their health infrastructure. What does that look like? I don't know where, where specifically in the country you spent time, but what does that look like? What is that 
permanent health structure look like on a on a ground level there? Well, in Uganda, it's incredibly underdeveloped, which is actually one of the big uh, problems with it. The only hospital in the entire country is in the capital city of Kampala. I spent most of my time north of the capital city um, in a couple of smaller municipalities um, that were, let's say, pretty poor. Um, They were destitutely poor. And what made this particular health infrastructure fascinating was it was technically a government-run facility. But it was staffed, and many of them actually are, by religious organizations. Um, I worked extensively with Catholic nuns who were actually running the medical facility and were – they were actually lovely. Uh, I had uh, the the chief um, – I forget what her title actually was. Um, she would always get up at like 3 in the morning to bake us donuts – and give so, them to so us. I so I just very want peculiar. our listeners to appreciate that uh, our host, Blake Phillips, is currently making finger guns at <laughs> us because he is just so enthused about the Catholic Church getting some good press here. Yes. Well, that, the, that is accurate, yes. Yeah, I mean, they they do some good work there. But it was interesting to see that this nominally government institution, because these were technically government facilities, were staffed by non-government employees. Because these were people who were volunteers. They were not being paid for their work. Um, But they did have government equipment and had government um, materials. And so I think that system was basically Uganda's best shot at trying to make their system. Because they just don't have enough doctors. They don't have enough people to do it. And so they're basically using these field facilities to say... Are you to the point where we have to send you to a different city to treat you? And A, is that even worth our time? They're basically doing pretty high-level triage there, saying, if we send you there, what's your likelihood of surviving? And is it worth the money we're going to expend? Because on one high-level medical procedure that we do here in the U.S., it might cost you upwards of $10,000. With that same amount of money, you can buy 40,000 doses of a vaccine that can save as many people. So it often becomes a question of them, how do we allocate our resources and do we bother to even send you to get medical assistance? At the risk of sounding very callous, it's really the only way that they can do it with the resources that they have. And NGOs that come into the country and international organizations that come to help, that's often the problem that the people who live in the country say. It's like, it's great when you all come, but the problem is you don't stick around. And for many of these NGOs, money is often a perpetual problem because they just don't have the resources to help. So while I'd love to dwell on the glowing praise of the the church in this one instance, um, how are countries fixing this? Um, What do we see as the solution? So we've talked, you touched briefly on the idea that they just can't train enough doctors fast enough. It's not happening. Um, That international aid workers are great, but they don't stick around. Um, And it's just not sustainable to be doing it the way that we are. Um, you know, the, the church staffs what it can, but you don't, there's not an infinite amount of, of kindly donut baking nuns. Um, what do we do? What are people doing? What solutions are we finding? Um, or maybe even postulate your own solutions. So the solution that we were trying to adopt while I was in Uganda was basically doing a two level system where we have basically in the home, have a few people in each area be very, very, very minimally trained to see medical problems and know that there's specifically medical problems that need to be addressed. So specifically when when I was talking about strep throat a little bit ago, they were there to identify whether or not it was strep throat or just a cold. Because if it's just a cold, the body can take care of it. It's not necessary to basically relieve somebody from a day of work and send them to actually get treated. And then if they identify somebody and we send them to one of these health centers, have the people like these nuns who are working there actually be trained to use portable machines in order to identify it. This way they don't need medical training, but they can actually do a doctor, a part of a doctor's job. And, and if they are minimally trained enough to see that, oh, this is actually a problem, they can forward it up. So it's creating more layers to make sure that critical cases actually get treated. Um, this is a very immediate fix, though. It's basically making sure that resources are allocated as efficiently as possible. It isn't a long-term solution. 
And I'm not really quite sure what the best long-term solution would be other than just, quite frankly, raising the GDP of these countries. Yeah. Because, like, when they're, when people have money, they're more likely to go get medical help. And, I mean, the, that was the problem in Uganda. There was one hospital that had, like, 30 doctors. And, like, that's not enough to treat an entire country of, I think it's, like, 15 million people. So there just weren't enough people. <laughs> Yeah, and there's a degree to which international aid organizations uh, kind of uh, help lighten the load on those health systems by um, by performing preventative treatments that that the hospitals. So the hospitals are taken up with critical cases. You know, they're treating the people who have gone to advanced stages of these diseases, and so often people who have the beginning stages where treatment would fix the problem. Um, permanently, um, they don't get treatment because the hospitals are overflowing with critical cases. So that's one way in which aid organizations are effective, is that they can come in and they can give basic preventative treatment. Um, but like William said, apart from magically raising the GDP of these countries and flying in 500 doctors who are just going to live there all the time and perform treatment, There's no easy solution. You have to perform the multi-level triage, like you said, making sure that cases go where they need to go. But at the end of the day, you know, you would need a political and economic reform of the century to to really see a a, a large, lasting improvement in in the health of the country. And even just beyond that, I've totally forgotten what I was going to say. <laughs> so never mind that. I, I had something else to add on. Uh, we're, we're fine. Okay. We're fine. Um, well, that's fair. Uh, I guess then what I would move on to, we've been talking um, a lot about uh, you know some of the, the more deadly conditions um, and what barriers are formed by economics, especially. Um, to treating them in, in all over the world, but specifically we've been using case studies out of Africa. Um, I want to pivot just briefly to um, social barriers. Um, we see um, different forms of social barriers to treating these sorts of things, but you get anecdotes. Um, you know, when the uh, Ebola crisis was huge in, uh, in 2013, 14, somewhere in there, um, we heard anecdotes of people, you know, in different African countries where laying hands on the dead was important to the burial process and it was increasing the, the spread of the disease. Um, but, it, you know, these sorts of customs range. We have um, places like Bangladesh and um, the Philippines where reproductive rights and stuff uh, like that get in the way of um, easily treatable and preventable women's health issues and, um, uh, we, we still constantly have anecdotes coming out of India where people, where women on the period will die um, because they've been isolated in rural communities um, as is per cultural practice to a hut where they no longer have access to the right sanitary conditions. Um, and, you know, what, what role do you all see the international community in playing um, a very dangerous game of surpassing, bypassing, changing cultural norms to the benefit of health systems? Um, Well, I'll say one thing, and and I think William mentioned something pertinent to this, um, that uh, pregnancy and specifically childbirth, um, the actual act of childbirth, as being one of the biggest stressors um, for women, um, as as being very dangerous, especially in developing countries. And that's a health problem that's very expensive to... Uh, kind of treat if you treat it at 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 kind of the moment of childbirth you know it, it requires a lot of kind of intensive care um but if you instead intervene earlier and kind of it, do two things kind of offer uh, birth control to reduce the number of pregnancies for women um and increase the infant survivability rate if you decrease child mor- mortality, suddenly women in those countries are having less children because there's no longer the heavy social onus to have this. And so you can see in kind of those examples that approaching um, diseases, especially in women's health, often you have to approach it 
from the uh, from a from a broader perspective. You know, what can you do to improve outcomes, not just in the specific uh, the specific uh, symptom range or in the specific disease, but more generally. Um, and, and social, I think what the practice is for most um, doctors, as I understand it, is to treat the social aspects of care as um, not irrelevant, but as something that you cannot personally change. Um, and you have, you just have to go in and you have to offer the best care and trust that that best care will improve outcomes both medically and socially. That that when you provide contraception and when you provide um, better prenatal care, you're going to also improve the social uh, conditions for women who are treated. The problem is with that, that at least I noticed, is that in many cases, especially Western doctors, struggle to actually separate that social preconditioning um, because most of them expect that their opinion will just be, it will be what it is and then it will be followed. In many of these cultures, there's, there was actually, well, not cultures in these countries, there was just, that I noticed, was a distrust of many of the decisions that Western doctors were making. Mm -hmm. This is extremely anecdotal, very isolated. I want to point out this story that I'm about to tell, but I think it proves part of the problem and this should not be considered at all emblematic. But when I was talking with some of the patients... There was a belief that the actually what we were telling them about contraceptives was misinformation by the United States government to help basically reduce the birth rate in these countries by rendering males sterile. Very, 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 very isolated case. But I want to point out that this is not the only such concern that many of them have. There's a misunderstanding. Misinformation is a huge problem in many of these countries. In the work that I did, there was a misunderstanding about how just genetics worked. Um, There was the belief that it was actually a choice by the woman on how the gender of the child was decided. Mm -hmm. And it was... that one's especially prominent in, in like, India, for instance, where um, there's a heavy preference for male children. Yeah. Precisely. There was also a preference for male children in Uganda when I I was talking with them, though it didn't seem as... um, it didn't seem as strong as it seems to be made out in India. It like there wasn't as big of an issue. Um, yeah, but, and I don't find that shocking. A lot of the societies, you know, rely on male labor for um, what is a lot more grueling work than we have to deal with in, in a lot of these uh, in more developed countries. Um, you talked, Jacob. You hinted a little bit about that uh, that idea that when you bring down where you when you raise the 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 or sorry yeah when you lower the infant mortality rate um, mm-hmm. you lower the number of, of pregnancies because they have more children that live to a workable age right um, and, yeah sorry and and I don't know if anybody really thinks about it in that in those terms but it's definitely true and William brought up something interesting in that um, often social norms will intrude onto medical treatment. They'll, you know, social norms will make it so that sometimes people don't follow medical advice. Um, And there's, I I haven't heard, I don't know if you guys have, but I have not heard of a good approach to that, a good way to, um, to account for that in medical treatment. Well, so Um, William, you made a quick pass at a possible answer and one that seems decently obvious, but, but one that, you know, maybe you all can shed a a little bit of light on how we might go about this. Um, but the idea that, um, it, it's, it's really an educational problem, um, that it's not necessarily just cultural norms that are age old and rooted in, in a longstanding belief. But, you know, the idea that the American government would be sterilizing, um, rural populations of, of, uh, third world countries, um, could not have arisen, you know, as a deep seated cultural idea. This has got to have sprung up in the past three or four generations. Um, well, okay, I want to go on a little tangent. Well, of there. course, yes. The colonial um, period would have seen very no, no. vast programs like this, but... Yeah, I was about to say, because th- these things aren't raising, aren't, aren't rising out of... You're right, they're not rising out of, you know, deep-seated ancient cultural norms. They're, they're rising out of very legitimate fears about yeah. U.S. medical practice. And I'm not saying yeah. that these things are not things that they shouldn't 
theoretically be worried about. I'm in practice, yeah. of course, we're not. Hopefully, if the U.S. government is listening, we better not be sterilizing African countries. But, <laughs> um, but, but generally, it's it's something that, especially with application with respect to the U.S., has mm-hmm. to have sprung up in the last at least three or four generations, if not even sooner than that. Yeah, um, and there's a tendency to think about it in Western countries as a superstition on the part of, of uh, you know, populations in these countries. And while that's certainly a component of it, we have to recognize kind of um, that while from our perspective it seems like a superstition, from the perspective of these people, it's a very legitimate belief and one that's rooted in their understanding of history. And I don't know, I don't, I don't really have an idea of how to, uh, you yeah, know, deal with that. And and that was always the problem that I struggled with. Even the doctors I was working with, many of the Western American doctors had, they were nice people, but they were always very condescending about it. They always just said, "Oh, like don't worry about that. Like just don't worry about." It. I'm like, but no, these are these are patients who genuinely don't think what you're doing is good for them. And it shouldn't it be part of your job to explain why this is like this is a necessary procedure? Like cuz to somebody who doesn't really have medical knowledge or like really an understanding of a medical system, this can all seem very 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 unusual, very 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 odd, like trying to explain try like try to imagine explaining chemotherapy to somebody who has no idea what it is. You're going to take poison and it's going to make you better. It doesn't make any sense. So it's very challenging when discussing with American doctors because they just think, oh, they'll, they'll understand. They won't. They legitimately won't because to, to people who just don't know what these things are and haven't been exposed to Western medicine their entire lives, it's unusual. And anything that's unusual tends to make people distressful. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. And I think what that naturally suggests is that as a part of broader health policy, um, you know, you can't just consider the physical um, the physical provision of treatment. You have to consider that education is going to have to be a non incidental part of um, any any health intervention. You know, and I think what makes it even more troublesome is that it, I don't think it can be successfully done by Western doctors, which mm-hmm. is frustrating because Western doctors want to be like, oh, I want to go and help. It's like, well, no. What you need to do is you need to take a backseat role and train locals who are willing to hear you out to help other people who live there because i notice this continually they always trusted people who were natives of that country which is understandable you tend to trust people who are also from where you're from makes sense to me and i was just like well they they trust them more and so if you can find one person who's willing to start the process it's the best way to do it and william from what i've been exposed to in terms of community health workers and and the larger sort of broader scale plans i think you're you're directly on the nose that right now a lot of international work by the world bank and other development organizations is pressing on getting locals to train as health workers so that doctors can speak through them and, and there, there's a lot more trust in that process. Um, well, we're running out of time. Um, I am going to uh, put to you all a last question, but first, uh, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, um, just a quick reminder to anybody who's a frequent listener, but anybody who's tuning in for the first time, um, this is an editorial podcast. Anything that we've said on this show, um, we stand behind. Uh, but does not represent the opinion of anybody working at or the college itself, uh, the College of William and Mary. Um, and also, if you enjoyed this podcast or have listened to any of our other ones and have enjoyed them, please uh, go and take a look at the podcasting network at William and Mary and the large lineup of other podcasts that, that we have that you may also enjoy. As a final question to you all, you're sitting at a desk and somebody comes in and they say, you've got a trillion dollars but you can only put it towards a program. What are you doing with that trillion dollars with respect to global health? So when I say a program, it can apply to as many countries as you want, but it can only address one something. It can provide drugs, it can train doctors, it can educate populaces. Uh, You don't have to outline the whole plan of what it would do, but... What is the most important thing for our money to be addressing right now? Yeah. Uh, go ahead, William. I need to think about my answer. So mine's going to be a little silly, but it's actually raise medical salaries. 
across the board. You got a trillion bucks, man. You can do that. <laughs> so if you could, part of the problem of getting doctors to work in developing countries is they don't get paid. I was recently in Peru and we ended, I talked with a lot of doctors there and they said that the biggest problem for a doctor in Peru is that they make under, how much did they say? I think it was under a thousand dollars a month. That in the U.S. is below the poverty line, um, and that's not really sustainable, which is part of the reason they have such a deficit of doctors in Peru. So if you want to get a lot of doctors in these developing countries, raise their salaries, and then you'll also have a lot of people being like, that whole doctor theme seems like a pretty pretty profitable profession, and you're going to have a lot more people going to medical school, get a lot more doctors on the field, which will hopefully expand the whole medical field to deal with actually many infectious diseases and issues and well, all around the world, actually. Um, so mine is a little bit similar. Um, well, not really at all, actually. I, I, do have that. <laughs> um, I like a little debate. Uh, I think if I had a trillion dollars to, you know, deal with health problems, I would say training nurse practitioners in developing countries, um, you know, doctors are really important, especially in big hospitals. But um, in my my impression is that nurse practitioners are able to provide the kind of immediately necessary medical uh, medical treatment that doesn't really need a lot of um, infrastructure to back it up. You know, they can go in with gauze and sutures and they can treat a lot of stuff that um, that they don't really need the hospital to do. Um, they can go out and do it in the community. So 